All right, Revelation chapter 3, of course, is the second half, really, of the letter specifically addressing the seven churches of Asia, the overall book, of course, addressing all the congregations. But when we study chapter 2 and 3, we see here, we get a glimpse of how the Lord views his people and the congregations of which they are a part. Um, when you read through it, you notice that he addresses them in very plain language. He, uh, how, how would you describe it? Maybe put it that way. It, he addresses them in plain language. What's another way to put this? He gives them the good and the bad. Okay, he gives them the good and the bad. Okay, easy to understand. But it seems slightly loud to me. Is it just me? Maybe. It seems a little loud to me. Is it just me? Go, go ahead. I think I would use the term blunt. He's blunt. Very direct. Very direct. And very succinct. I mean, you look at the letter to Smyrna, it takes up four verses, or it's divided into four verses, and then you get over to um, the letter to Thyatira, and it takes up 12 verses. When you compare that to Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, or First and Second Corinthians, I mean, that's a massive amount of material that's addressed to those churches. And here, these are very short, very blunt, very to the point, and he just hits it one after the other. And the expectation, of course, as is repeated over and over, is that they're going to hear this, the idea being they're going to receive it, they need to apply it in order to be right with God and to get through what is about to hit them. Um, when you look at these things, of course, I believe as y'all studied, I was out last week, of course, uh, but... You see, he addresses both the good and the bad, both strengths and weaknesses in the congregations. And the same strengths exist today in congregations to various degrees in various ways, whether it's doctrinal purity or great zeal for the cause of Christ, um, things like that. There are problems that still exist in churches today. The lack of zeal and motivation, false doctrine creeping in, compromising with culture. Um, the thing that we want to think about as we go through this is what applies to the Newton Church of Christ. What kind of strengths do we have? And what kind of weaknesses do we have? Mike? Well, over and over, each one I'm told, you're about to go through some tribulation. Some of you are not prepared for that. And the weaknesses that you now have are only going to be multiplied. You have to fix these first. And even in today, congregations all over the United States are talking about the loss of freedom, the attack of freedoms that we have, the moral decay that we have, and the you know, even the right now it becomes slander, you know, and stuff like that against members of the church. But it's going to get worse. So all of these things that we see that are their problems, we have to look in and say, if that's a problem here, we need to fix those weaknesses because they are only going to be amplified in the future. Okay. And as we go through these three letters in chapter three, of course, one of them is all good. The other two are not good. And we have, just as the Lord is being honest with them and expecting them to take an honest look at themselves, we have to take an honest look at ourselves and not lie to ourselves, deceive ourselves into thinking everything's okay when everything may not be okay. So let's look now, uh, Daniel, or Daniel, hello. Uh, Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. Who will read that for us? Revelation 3, 1 through 6. Todd. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, that you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. 
So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments and I will not erase his name in the book of life and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. So just briefly a little bit of background on Sardis itself. Um, it had a stronghold that was about 950 feet up off the main plateau or the main area there. And it was surrounded by triple walls. But it had been breached in times past because they failed to watch. They were so comfortable, so what they thought in their mind, we're so secure up here, nobody could possibly get to us. But the enemies crept in, snuck in by stealth, and they were able to get in and to overtake that city. Uh, it was destroyed by an earthquake in 17 AD. And um, the economy had a lot to do with fruits, so agriculture, but then also wool. There's a particular type of wool there. They had gold and silver mines in the area. Uh, there has been an ancient synagogue discovered there that was uh, what's described as one of the most ornate ancient synagogues. Ancient synagogues usually were relatively plain compared to you know Greek structures and Roman structures, uh, but this one was pretty ornate with various mosaics within it. And so what that indicated is there was great wealth there and great wealth among the Jewish people. Um, the culture and society at Sardis was known to be rather loose. Uh, they were pleasure and luxury loving people, so much so that pagans, other pagans, looked at Sardis as being decadent, which it's hard to imagine in that pagan culture, but they looked at them, <laughs> those people are really bad. Um, I guess it'd be like our rotted culture looking at San Francisco and going, that's really bad. Uh, that's how bad they were. So um, he describes himself here, verse 1, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. What are the seven spirits? Do you remember what we identified those with back in chapter 1? Because you know each one of these he's pulling out of chapter 1 and playing off of what's already been revealed, but... Seven spirits. Messengers. Uh, could be messengers, but really in chapter one, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Remember, he mentioned the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit there in chapter one, and the way that the spirits described as the seven spirits, using that symbolism of seven and a completeness. There's a totality of revelation that the Holy Spirit is given. So here he's talking about he who has a spirit, he's in unity with the spirit, he's in conjunction with the spirit. They're working together in these things. And the seven stars, as you guys have mentioned, the seven angels, messengers of the churches. Go ahead. Actually, in chapter 1, the last verse, the seven stars are the angels. Yes. Yeah, seven stars are the angels. Yep, exactly right. So... Um, what good is mentioned about this church? About the congregation as a whole? I want to read that again. But you are dead. Okay. They had a few that had not the file. So there were a few that had remained pure. Right. So that, if, if you notice this pattern that he goes down, that in each one of these letters, if there's something good about the congregation as a whole, he mentions that. And then he mentions something bad, usually. If there's something bad to be mentioned. Here, there's no good that's mentioned at the front. There's something bad, but then he comes back and says, there's a few who haven't defiled yourself. So it's almost like as a whole, you guys, as he says here, you're dead as a whole, as a congregation. But there are a few in there 
who are still maintaining, which we'll get to in just a minute. But the, the funny thing about this is, in what's written here to Sardis, there's really no description of outward pressure. Mike? Yeah, it seems as if one of the good things they have, actually, is that they at least have a good reputation. However, the name that they have, the reputation they have, is not matching the actual works. So on the outside, it looks all nice and pretty, you know, and all that, but on the inside, and which is where congregations are made, and, you know, is what defines a congregation, that's what is rotten. Right, right, exactly right. And <clears throat> there's no doctrinal invasion. You know, there's, in chapter 2, doctrine of the Nicolaitans, there's no false prophet that's coming here like Jezebel or prophetess. Uh, none of that's being mentioned in here. Uh, there's no Jewish persecution attacking them here. So it's, this is just where they have had a problem with compromising with the culture that is around them. And they had an internal danger uh, being lethargic or being comfortable with the world around them. And that's, that's a real danger for any of us, that we just get comfortable and we begin to look at the world, compare ourselves to the world, well, we're a little bit better than them. We're not totally like them. Yeah, there's some things, but not all things. And, and not looking at the Word of God as our standard. That's a problem here at Sardis. Reminds me of whenever Lot went to Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, you know, he kind of knew, and then he was just kind of this righteous man who was just there, just kind of just there. You know, on the outside, everything looked okay, but on the inside, he was vexed, you know. I mean, there was a lot kind of going on, but it never kind of indicates that he ever did anything to uh, affect change. Well, and, and that's a, a good analogy there. You take Lot's family as a whole. There was a few, one man, who it vexed his righteous soul, but what happened to his family? All of them were corrupt. I mean, he lost daughters in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. His wife died on her way out, and his other two daughters were morally corrupt. Just completely ruined his family because they absorbed that culture and those attitudes, maybe not fully, but at least they became very comfortable with it. And Sardis here is very comfortable with that atmosphere around them. Any other thoughts? All right, so as we think about that, it says that they have this reputation of being alive. What would it be to be alive? As, as the Lord's looking at this congregation, how would a congregation be alive? If you looked at a congregation and you thought, wow, they're really on fire, what kind of things would come to mind? Okay, they would be worshiping. Yeah. Properly. Properly. Scripturally. Yeah. Having zeal to do God's will. Having zeal, which would mean what? Do what? Building up. Hey, building up. I think it would involve uh, public activity seeking and reaching out to teach and to spread the word. I mean, if you, you can't be alive and be inactive. If you're alive, you're going to be active. Right. They're at, they're, they, they were known. They were, they were teaching. At one point, I assume they were growing. Uh, they desired to grow themselves as well as others. Exactly. They were studious at one point, right? They, they were digging into the Word. They wanted to hear that Word. They may have been evangelistic not only locally, but helping to support other evangelists. When you think about a congregation that's alive, there, there are many things that they would be doing, and you would see that evidence in the activities that they're doing, in their personal growth, you know, maturing, becoming a congregation with leadership, and, and pressing forward in the kingdom of God. So they had this reputation of being alive. Well, that was the past. But what were they? They did something to earn that reputation, right? But now, what's the problem? 
they let it die. What they did to get there has just died off. Okay, so so the church at Thyatira, the church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, uh, when they talked about the brethren at Sardis, how would they have talked about the brethren at Sardis, generally speaking? What was their reputation? <laughs> they, oh, yeah, those, those folks are good. Yeah, old brother so-and-so down there at Sardis, he... Yeah, you, oh, you're going through that area, be sure to stop there and worship. That's the kind of thing. But the Lord says, no, you're dead. Doesn't matter what anybody thinks about you, what anybody says about you, you're dead. <coughs> Verse 3 kind of really seems... You're getting ahead of me. Okay. <laughs> We're in verse 1. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll get there in just a minute, so hold that thought. Hold that thought. So how can a church have a name that's alive but actually be dead? I think you, you have to have some time to exist for a while. And at the very beginning, you know, that congregation is kind of going along really well, building a name for themselves for all those things that we could say a thriving young congregation is doing. And then you kind of get established, and as time goes along, and then it becomes more of a checklist time of thing where they're this, they don't have this, they've got this, they don't have that, so therefore they're more and more faithful. You know, now we have like the Churches of Christ, you know, so prevalent, but then too, there's a lot of Churches of Christ that are dead. You know, when we try to vacation or go places, we try to find a sound congregation. Right. Yeah. Right, and... and Maybe you, <clears throat> as you read through these letters, there's congregations you're aware of, maybe you've been a part of, maybe you visited, maybe you just know of, that fit these description. There's one that fits this description for me very well. That they, they've got this reputation. People who move into the area generally end up going there because they have this reputation. They have this big network of people that you know, reaches far and wide throughout the nation. A lot of people end up there. But I, I am absolutely convinced, 100%, they're dead. There's a few maybe who haven't defiled themselves, but, but they are dead. But it, it's reputation of a lie, but being dead, do you have something? Yes? I was going to say, even as individual Christians, it's just like the church, I mean, even outwardly be doing what the public is seeing, everything we're supposed to be doing. But we can be dead, we can just be we're trying to show, you know, these things outwardly, but what's inside is, is maybe not, you know, maybe we're not perfect. Yeah. The, the Lord described those Pharisees as whitewashed tombs, you know, inside are dead men's bones. People, people think, oh, they're beautiful, they're wonderful. How great to look upon, but they were dead inside. It, that's a good point. And they, they rest on their past reputation. Have you ever, maybe you've run into this in the workplace. Somebody who did really good the first five years, the first 10 years, but then they decided time to coast. And who likes those people? What, what do generally the people under them want to do? Well, no, not necessarily. At least my experience, maybe they do want to, oh, I don't coast like him. Uh, but Generally, they want him out. I, you know, what's he doing in that position? And he's just coasting and he's pushing everything on us. He's got work to do or she's got work to do. But um, they were just living on that past reputation, uh, that outward appearance, as we said. And it, it could even be that their numbers are still increasing, but it's not a result of being convicted of truth in submitting to the Lord, it's because maybe it's the popular place to go. That there's really warm and friendly people there. Should we be warm and friendly? Yeah. But that's, that's not what should draw people into a congregation. It should be a, a conviction of truth and dedicated to the Lord. So they had this outward appearance that was healthy, but inside they were dead. Anything else in verse 1? All right, jumping down 2 and 3 here. He gives a warning in that exhortation, be watchful, uh, be watchful for these things. Now, when he tells him to watch, be watchful, I think uh, 
Todd's translation down in verse 3 had, um, was it pay attention, Todd? Verse 3 where it says, remember how you received and heard, hold fast, repent. Therefore, if you will pay attention. It says, therefore, if you do not wake up. Okay, if you do not wake up. And in the New King James, it's translated as watchful. And that's playing on that city history that they thought, oh, we're good to go. They weren't watchful. And the enemy snuck in and took them on more than one occasion. And so he's telling them, you better be on the watch because you're in very real danger here. So remember. Uh, remember what? What what, what have they received and heard? The gospel. the gospel. Exactly right. There are some things, there's some small bit of strength here, and the way that that's going to be built up, the way that you're going to be able to recover is remember those things that you have received and that you had heard. Gail, verse 3, what you got? I, it just is um, encouraging that he reminds them that you know, you heard, you're aware, and you better get busy <laughs> because it's all gone if you don't get up and get busy, but you have to repent. <clears throat> yes, you've got to repent. You've got to turn around. You're headed the wrong way. You need to turn around every and do what you know is right. And you know, generally, that's, that's our problem, isn't it? We know what's right. We just let it go or forgotten about it or pushed it aside and just preferred to do something else. So he says you need to remember what's right and turn around and do it again. Because if you don't watch, what's he going to do? Verse 3. Think that they're not. Yeah, he'll come on you. He'll... He'll sneak up on you and you'll be finished and it's over. Take away that candle, the candlelight, right? All right, verses 4 to 6 then, he gives this promise, if you will. So you have a few names who haven't defiled themselves. They shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. The white indicating what? Clean, pure. Yeah, clean, pure. They're pure. They've not been defiled. They've not been soiled. But they are pure and they're going to walk with me in purity. And each one of these promises as you go down through here, it, it's stated a different way. Just like he describes himself in a different way in each one of these, the promise is described in a different way, but it's the same exact promise every time. They're going to be in heaven. They're going to be eternally redeemed. That's what he's giving the promise. And that, that's what he's saying. Here's the consequence. It's, it's not like a light consequence here. It's not like it's simply the matter of you're going to be a congregation or you won't be a congregation. You're, you'll be able to assemble together and, and worship together and work together or you're going to be scattered to the four winds. He's saying what's on the line here is your eternal soul. So you need to wake up. You need to do what is right. But what do you get out of this when it says that there are a few names. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, will not blot out his name from the book of life. Individuals. Individuals. Yeah, you know, God is able to surgically remove the good and the bad. And that's what the sword of the Spirit does. I mean, it goes to the intent of the heart of man and is able to uh, to bring us under the spirit and soul and, and is able to see what, what an individual is about and what is that individual doing for the bigger kingdom of God. The congregation is a little consequence if you have uh, individuals that aren't doing what they're supposed to. May I see you have oh. Yeah, he, he judges us individually. We're part of a congregation, and we will give an account for being a part of a congregation. You know, if the congregation is tolerating sin and wickedness, and, and we're there, and we don't do anything about it, and we just remain, and we, they, we're going to give an account for that. But here, he's saying, look, as a congregation, you're dead. 
But I do see individuals in there who are still striving to live right. And they remain committed and they stick with it and they don't go the way the rest of them go. Here's the promise that I give them. Mike. It's almost as if the others become stumbling block to these who want to do right. Mm -hmm. And that tends to be the judgment part of it also, is that that's what hinders our you know, congregation from being able to do as much as possible as we can or not because of individuals. Yeah, individually we have to be committed, otherwise the congregation will be weakened. Exactly. All right, well, let's, let's press on now, verses 7 to 13, with the letter to Philadelphia. Who will read Revelation 3, 7 to 13? And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens, and no one shuts, and shuts, and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie and hate you. I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to, preserve, to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name, he who has him here, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. So Philadelphia, uh, the city was originally built to spread Hellenism, the Greek culture, further to the east. So it was a missionary city, if you will. Uh, it had a history, though, of changing names. Different people or different conquerors or prominent individuals. Uh, when something major happened, they would change the name to be named after that person, which, you know, for us is kind of weird. Uh, but that's what they would do, and that wasn't all that uncommon in the ancient world, but they did it more frequently than others. Uh, paganism was rampant there. It was known as Little Athens. And what do we remember about Athens? Described in Acts chapter 17. They were idolaters. They worshipped absolutely everything, and if they didn't even know what it was, they still worshipped it. Right, right. It was it was easier to find a man than an or find an idol than a man. It was said in Athens. So this is how this Philadelphia was. Uh, they had a lot of sensual worship. Uh, they had a lot of intoxication, a lot of drunkenness there. So it was a morally impure city and environment. And he writes this letter to the church in that environment. Uh, and of course, as we go through, we see that this is a really good congregation overall. How does the Lord describe himself there in verse 7? The opening of the door would be salvation. Okay, okay, there's there's that and what's what's his personal character? Okay, he's separate, he's holy, he's true, what he says is absolutely true. And then to the Todd's point there, what does he have? What does he possess? Key of David. Key of David, which represents what? Salvation. Salvation, a key being the idea of power and authority. You know, if you have a key to this building, you have authority to be in this building. Unless you've stolen it, that's another issue. But the idea is he has the key of David to open up that door to, for people to come in and enjoy the blessings of the kingdom. And so he's got that key. He is holy. He is true. Uh, there's nothing bad mentioned about this congregation. What good is mentioned here, verses 8 and 9. It kept uh, Christ's word. 
Okay, they've kept his word. In spite of what? Okay, there's that contrast there a little bit later. Um, it would be like if we found a pure and faithful church like downtown New York City or downtown San Francisco. Like, wow, there is a solid group of faithful Christians in the middle of all of that. I mean, there's, he doesn't mention any compromise, any corruption. Wow. That's amazing. So that he says, I know your works. I know you've been busy. I know you've been working in the kingdom. You've been advancing the cause. And you've kept my word. You've not denied my name. There was pressure to deny the name of Christ. He says, you, you've not denied it. You remain true. You remain faithful, if you will. There's an open door. What's that open door? He says, I've set before you an open door. When you think in the New Testament, a door being open, what does that bring to mind? A door Hope. open to spread the word. I guess opportunity to... Okay, Philadelphia is a missionary city to spread Greek culture. And he's pointing out to them, you have this opportunity... And I know that you've been busy at spreading the word, spreading the culture of Christ, if you will, spreading that philosophy, that doctrine in the world around. So you have that open door of growth and faithfulness and to spread the truth, to bring others to the Lord. Um, any other thoughts there? Verse 8. Mike. Mike. Whenever I read that, you know, I think of someone who, you know, has taken the talents and skills, whatever they have available to them, and have turned that into the opportunities that they now have. And, um, you know, it may not be the brass group, it may not be this group, it may not be that group. We don't have a lot of money, we don't have this, but everything that they did have, they used to the betterment of the kingdom of God. Right. Exactly right. And them being surrounded by this overwhelmingly pagan culture and pagan society in general and with what's about to unfold, one of the things that he's really telling them here is there's some hope here. There's hope for you and hope for others. Now, backing up to the really big picture, so we're in the late first century Roman world, what happened with this culture, this society, this empire as we fast forward over the next two, five, six hundred thousand years? What happens? Yeah, it deteriorates, just falls apart, right? But what's he telling these people? As that society is crumbling, descending into corruption, chaos. He tells them to persevere, but he's telling them something else. So we, I'm being redundant here. Verse 8, what's he telling them? That's another door for you. It's a big opportunity because as society continues to crumble, people are going to want something that's not going to fall out from underneath them. The Word of God provides that. Exactly. Where are we in our society? Okay, you and I can argue afterward. I'll be proved to be right when I present everything. But it's crumbling. It is falling apart. We are decaying at an amazingly rapid pace, in my opinion. Okay. But there's an open door. There is opportunity before us. As Mike said, there are people who are searching for something that has some constancy, some reliability to it. It's one thing to think about is that's the only, only possible opportunity the society has to turn around is for God's word to come. Exactly. It's just the it's going there's... <laughs> Exactly right. So he says in verse 9, 
You know, there are those who are the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews. Who would these people be? Judaizing teachers. Okay. It may be those Judaizing teachers. And we also know... Jewish Christians. Well, there, it may be the Jewish Christians. I would suggest to you that these are Jews who have been opposed to Christianity from the beginning, that, that element, that mindset. He says, look, they're, they're claiming to be Jews. It's, it's like today. We still have this problem today, especially over the past few weeks, okay? We, we can have a political discussion about Israel, the modern nation, versus Palestinians and Hamas, okay? We, we can have that discussion. But our society generally looks at Israel and they have a knee-jerk reaction and one view in the religious society, I should say, around us. And what is that? They're God's people. So. Oh, they're still God's people. Yeah. You know, the, the Jews, you know, we've studied in the book of John where it says, you know, there will come a day when they're going to persecute you and think they're doing God's will in this. And that's how these would have viewed themselves. They're still holding fast. Going to the synagogue, right? reading the scriptures, living moral lives, and stamping out that sectarianism in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They thought they were faithful. They thought they were God's people, but what does he describe them as? Satan. Synagogue of Satan. Let's make no mistake about it. Anybody who is against the Lord and His truth is of Satan. There are no in-betweens. Either you're with the Lord or you're with the devil. And he's very clear about that here. He says, I, I know those people. I know who they are. And I will, uh, I will make them come and worship before your feet. What does that mean? Is he saying they're going to worship you like you worship me? What's, he, what's the idea being conveyed here? We have that relationship with God. Know. Right. He's, he's going to crush them. You, you're going to triumph in this struggle that's going on there. You're, you're going to triumph. Yes, exactly. And he says, and know that I have loved you. Right? It's time's going to bear out that I've loved you, I'm with you, you are my people, not them. Time will bear that out. All right, so question number five. How would the Philadelphians keep from losing their crown? In verse 11. You've kept my camp, command to persevere. Hold fast. What does it mean to hold fast? What would that look like? Don't let the culture or belief in the truth. Yeah, don't get swept away in it. Stand your ground. Yes, stand your ground. Don't don't let these people get to you. Uh, it's interesting that he says here. Um, that I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. So what he's describing, you look at these other ones, this hour of trial, you look at, you know, some of you are going to be thrown into prison, be faithful until death and all of that. But here he tells them, I'm going to keep you from that. Philadelphia was not a strong center of emperor worship. Now he had other paganism, but it wasn't a strong center of emperor worship. So what he's telling them here is, you've remained faithful I'm going to bless you that you're going to be essentially protected or not that they'll be totally unaffected, but you're not going to face it like everybody else is going to face what's about to unfold and happen. And so, you know, one of the lessons we get here is as we're faithful to God, sometimes we avoid issues that other people face, right? I think churches of Christ in general, sound ones to Anita's point, that there are times when we fly under the radar fly under the radar of the government because we're not big enough to get their attention. We don't do things that would attract attention. 
in some cases. So in that sense, look at Philadelphia. They're, they're faithful in the Lord saying, you, you know, I'm going to keep you from that hour of trial. Not that they wouldn't have any at all because he told them to remain faithful, but you're not going to face it like they're facing it, Mike. It sounds like the community may actually, around them, may actually benefit from some of that as well. Right. That's what you're describing. So, you know, righteous people being inside of the community actually brings some of the wrath of God not upon all. Salt of the earth. Sodom and Gomorrah would have been spared for ten right. righteous people. Just go back into the history of this country. You see the general principles that were put in place when this country was developed were based on Christian values. So this country has prospered and done well. Yes. You know, we now see that decay, so the country's falling apart. Right. Those values are falling apart. The country's falling apart. So just one brief thing, and we're going to move on to uh, Laodicea here. But when he talks about writing the name, remember the name, the name of the city of Philadelphia changed over time. And he's saying, I'm, I'm going to write my name on you. And so it's playing into that history of the city there. But let's move forward now. Uh, Revelation 3, 14 to 22. Who will read that for us? Mike. To the angel of the church of Laodicea you're right. The Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. And I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. Laodicea was the least Greek of all these cities in the area. Uh, they even spoke their own local language. You know, Greek overtook the ancient world, but these people sort of remained immune to that to a de one degree or another. Uh, they had a school of medicine there for, and it was known for its ointment for eyes and for ears as well. It was very wealthy, had a very strong banking system there. Uh, lots of gold kept in those banks. They had black wool. Um, after an earthquake in 60 AD, they paid to rebuild their own city. Normally cities appealed to the you know, Roman government to send funds to them. But they just, they said, no, we don't want any help from Rome. We've, we've got plenty of money, and, and they did it themselves. Um, but it was thoroughly pagan. Coins minted here in the city, they, they found that they were given the honor, so to speak, to have the imperial temple for Domitian there, one of the Roman emperors. So they were, it was a cult, uh, you know, a, um, an emperor cult it was very strong there. Um, so Jesus describes himself. There's just one thing I want to pick up on here. He says, these things says the amen. What does that mean? How, how does that strike you when he says that he is the amen? The last word. Last word. Amen literally means so be it. means he's got the last word in everything. Now, it says, I know your works. That they are what? Neither hot nor cold. cold, but lukewarm. What does he want to do with them? Vomit. What comes to mind when you think about vomit? What's that? Terrible, bad, you know. Terrible, bad, gross, disgusting. 
We don't want to look at it. We don't want to smell it. We don't want to hear it. It's just gross, right? Imagine the Lord. You, you're sitting there in this congregation the next time you assemble. That letter shows up and that's read out loud. The Lord wants to vomit us out of his mouth. Do, do you think that's how they viewed themselves? No. No. They didn't. And that's why he's having to write them. says, Here, here's your problem. You look warm and I just want to vomit you out of my mouth. This city was considered to be a retirement city. So people go there and just lay back. So you think about that imagery in here. He says, you just, you just lost it. You're just lukewarm. You're not on fire. You're, you're not against me. You're just it's terrible. What would being lukewarm, what kind of message would that send to the world around them? It's okay to ride the fence with God. It's okay to kind of do the things and not do the things. Yeah. Christianity is just this easy. It's... It's in mind there's a congregation that is, has become a congregation of mostly older people. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten so small that they can barely exist. Mm -hmm. They still continue to meet. Mm -hmm. But they do nothing beyond. Just meeting. They just meet. They've gotten to the point where we just show up. We're just sort of keeping house. Yeah. Kind of what comes to mind with me. Is they're, right. They're definitely, they're neither hot nor cold, so therefore they're not doing anything. They're not messing up in any way, so to speak. They're just not doing it. Right. They're just going with the flow. Right. They're not rocking the boat against anything bad that's coming in. They're not standing up for God's work. Right. Well, it gives the impression they're indifferent about what the person next to them is doing. As a Christian, mm -hmm. they're just indifferent about that. I'm doing, I'm just doing my thing, you do yours. It's just indifference. Yeah. They, they kind of want the claim to Jesus, but they also really like what's going on around them and want to participate in it. So they're just lukewarm. They, they claim they were rich, wealthy, in need of nothing. And wow, the language here, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You're in terrible condition. You can't even see it. How, how sad that is. So he tells them, buy gold from the Lord, true riches of the Lord. Buy the white garments, cover your nakedness. Use the eye salve so you can see clearly that the Lord has to offer you all of that being rooted in His Word that you would have these things. But He says something here that is so hopeful in verse 19. What is that? I want to vomit you out of my mouth. You're wretched. You're miserable. But I'm telling you that because I love you. You need to hear it. And we all need to hear those kinds of things at times. Where somebody who loves us just tells us straight up exactly where our problem is to wake us up, to get us to change so that it's for our benefit. It's for us to be improved, to turn around from that path of destruction. And that's what he's doing to them. Be zealous. Be on fire. Be hot. Repent. Turn back to me. And he says, if you do that, then you will be with me. And it's interesting, he says, I stand at the door and knock. The Lord has to knock to enter into his own congregation of people. All right, any other thoughts? We're out of time. Just, just one more thought. All right, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you all, Lord willing, uh, four and five next week.